Happy Wednesday and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnson directed uh, picture, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane geek from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So Jim, uh, as you know, we've got a pretty special guest, our, our first guest of the series. We do. Uh, with us here today. Uh, it's a man by the name of Tom Geyer. Now, Tom is uh, one of the owners and, uh, and the lead composer for a company called Brand X Music. And uh, we'll let Tom uh, tell us in a moment uh, some of the uh, some of the films, primarily trailers and, and pre-release uh, sorts of things he's worked on. I guarantee you've heard of pretty much all of them. But uh, <clears throat> this is a big deal for me because uh, Tom and I first met, would have been in uh, the fall of 1976, and uh, but today is, I think, uh, pretty much the first time we've heard each other's voices in a little more than 30 years. So uh, we stayed connected over social media once that became a thing, but uh, kind of a long lost friend situation. So, uh, so Tom, welcome. Welcome back, old friend. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I, being a, a non aviator, uh, I just think back on those days of, of, Grass airstrips and ultralights and model rocketry with with Hal as uh, some of the fondest memories of childhood. So it's a it's a real gas to be here talking music and talking planes with you guys. I'm I'm very honored. Absolutely. And uh, uh, any of my friends out there that follow me on social media have have seen me mention once or twice the epic Star Wars themed birthday party we shared. Our birthdays just a few days apart. That would have been in uh, back in May of '78. Um, so, uh, so Jim, if you don't mind, Tom and I are going to retrace our entire personal history, uh, probably <laughs> sure, hour you by got, hour. You guys catch up. I'll just sit here and watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We'll catch so, you at minute 56 or something. Like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so then in 1977, uh, <clears throat> anyway, no, it's great to have you back. And then, uh, you know, one other thing, Tom and I have this, uh, have this other history, uh, at least my first actual job. And I think maybe Tom was yours as well. Uh, is we worked together, and you played piano, I played drums, and we did the uh, the Southeast County, or King County, uh, outside of Seattle, the Blue Hair Brunch Circuit. And we provided uh, entertainment on Sunday afternoons, and we worked for tips. And, and how else did we get paid? Uh, in, in French dip sandwiches, I believe. And and yeah. Hal's, Hal's, Hal's family always had hot and run, uh, running supply of red vines, so that was the yes. bonus as well. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, we were 13 or 14, and I still, have, uh, I still have one of those business cards that we had uh, we had back there with our names and phone numbers on it. So. You, sent that, uh, you sent that scan to me, and it blew my mind. I love <laughs> Isn't that it. wild? It, it, it was only yesterday, and we are not any older, uh, any heavier, or uh, any more wise than we were then. So Absolutely not, especially that last part. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so Tom, we've got uh, we've got you here with us today. We're going to join us as we talk through this minute. And uh, um, I don't, Jim, you kind of you usually sort of provide the structure and, and lead our way through. Why don't you? Uh, well, yeah, we're 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 watching scene. we're watching a uh, PV strap uh, Cliff into into his uh, into his little GB there, and. Uh, uh, PV had just told him that, you know, uh, we're going to go all the way to the Nationals if this thing works out. And so Cliff says, let's make some history. Right. And then so, that canopy comes down on his head and, and it's, you know, it's like wearing a helmet. You get, you know, getting shoved into something, uh, something like this. It's just, just amazing. Um, I'm sure we go into this uh, in other episodes, but I've, I've sat in uh, kind of this airplane's sort of its sister ship. And uh, it is, it is tight and every bit as claustrophobic as you can imagine. <laughs> I've got to ask about the. Uh, we're looking at that one close up in second five, where, where as as uh, Goose behind him is uh, locking in the the top of the canopy. You can see the the fabric design, the, the, you know, the fabric outer skin of the GB. Now, is that uh, is that like a muslin uh, canvas, or would it be a fiber? I mean, I guess it would be fiberglass nowadays. But, right. Uh, so in this era, it would be a. Uh, it would likely be cotton. So it's actually like a grade A, uh, a grade A aircraft cotton that's then uh, sprayed with dope to tighten it and shrink it and and make it non-porous and and uh, and all that stuff that would provide the strength. This particular airplane, this replica built by a guy named Bill Turner in the late seventies, um, back when Tom and I met. If you'd like to go back to that era again, uh, anyway, it. Uh, 
even at that point, it was probably done with a synthetic covering. And certainly today, anything like this would use a synthetic covering like uh, a polyfiber. It's um, kind of a distant relative of polyester. A similar process, you lay it on, uh, you put some, some other uh, uh, a solution on top of it, then you shrink it and it, uh, it adheres. And it actually provides a great deal of, of strength to the, expo- to the uh, ribs and longerons in the fuselage. Oh, I've I've been around uh, not not on planes but on boats. There is a, a a shrink wrap that you use in the winter time when you're winterizing a boat. I was thinking, are any of these done with like heat treatment? Heat treatment where you just run a you know like a hot air gun over it, or would that be? Actually, uh, the they almost all have some uh, some sort of heat process. Some of them just use uh, use sort of a, a, an iron. Um, there's a new product now called Oratex, which is. Uh, a little bit more akin, uh, if you've ever done any RC modeling, if you remember Monocoat being a, okay, kind of yeah. a clear plastic film, you sort of stick that on there, then you hit it with a hot with a, a hot air gun or, you know, a really hot hair dryer if you've got such a thing, and it shrinks on. So similar process. Yeah. Okay. And, well, and back back to uh, back to throwback. So this would be similar to what we did with our combat kittens uh, control line planes in in uh, aviation class. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Back in eighth grade, we had that aviation class. We had those control line airplanes turned into. I'm still dizzy thinking about that. I yep. just flew a control line airplane about a year ago for the first time since that class. You know, I've done a lot of other model aviation over the years, and it's the, the smell of dope will never leave my mind. That's just, <laughs> that's exactly. All these We're talking about aircraft butyrate dope. To be clear, <laughs> to be this is a clear. Disney film. <laughs> Stay clean, kids. All right. Yeah. If you want to end up like Tom, Jim, and me, okay, <laughs> sniff you know, the dope. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. If you want to end up stick, like us, yeah, stick with stick with Elmer's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stay away from the sharpies and the dope, kids. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> wow. Well, <laughs> we're back with another geezer, geezer's minute in just a moment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we uh, we're watching uh, the lit. Is the fuel cap open there toward the front? I'm, uh, up right at second five to the uh, to the left. I'm just trying to figure out what that is on that that panel that's holding down. Uh, I guess Cliff is looking out of it. It looks like some kind of an access port on the lower left hand side of the screen. Yeah, that would be that would be that's interesting that you call that out. That's that's folded in, and that's something that. Uh, you know, that cliff could attach from the inside. And that is, looks to me like, is that actually part of the canopy assembly that's going on over him? So that's probably something that, uh, uh, that would cover the latch, make sure he doesn't accidentally, you know, deploy it when he doesn't mean to. Yeah, he shuts it at the very last second. Yeah. Se- se- second as soon seven. as it's out of down and in tight around him. Yeah, so he's going to shut that right yeah. there. Okay, so he shuts that. And then, uh, uh, then we get into some uh, more mechanical issues here. The uh, uh, cliff tells, uh, tells Goose to crank her up. Right. So I guess we're going to get into the uh, the starting process of uh, of how to start a GB. Well, this is interesting too because by this time, by 1938, now the the GB is a little bit of an anachronism here. It, this would have been the sort of hot uh, race plane of the day, about maybe five to seven years earlier than the film takes place. But it's still very much okay. Still would have been, uh, you know, a viable contender. And uh, we had electric starters in airplanes by then, where you turn a key and it, it swings the prop. But uh, when you're talking about something racing, even something sort of as stout and bulky as the GB, it's still always about saving weight. So it'd be very appropriate, very realistic to say we wouldn't put an electric starter in there. We'd save the several pounds uh, and make the airplane that much lighter and just a little bit faster. So, uh, you know, what's happening here then is uh, you see, um, uh, and we only see him from behind, but the guy in the hat, which character is, is that, that representing that's Goose. Jim? That, that's, that's Goose. That's Goose. But I don't think it's, I don't think they really taught uh, Goose the character, the actor, to swing the props. So they probably got somebody standing in for him. I would assume, but maybe not. But uh, anyway, you notice he sort of lines the propeller up just right, and that's so he can get a good swing on it, get good momentum. And then he tells Cliff, "Make it hot." And that means turn the magnetos on. So basically, the ignition is on. We got two two magnetos in this in an airplane like this. The ignition's on, and now instead of an electric motor swinging the propeller to kick it off. We, we do what uh, what some people jokingly call the Armstrong method, which is, in other words, using your strong arms to uh, to swing it. And, uh, you know, as Cliff also calls out, he says, make it hot, and he calls back hot and brakes. That means that uh, that the ignition is on and the brakes are set. And obviously, you want the brakes held as tight as a pilot can hold them so you don't accidentally roll forward into the guy that just started the engine for you. It's, wow. it's politeness. Yeah. That, yeah. Could, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up that with Indiana be, Jones, and that's a different movie. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> Now, I, I don't know if this is just the trick of the strobing of the camera, but as I noticed, as Goose does the startup sequence, 
does does the propeller reverse itself there on as, as it makes the half turn it just seems to crank one way and then flips back the other oh give me a second that you're talking about here which uh, are you talking looking, about the longer shot or, or uh, still over lo- his the, shoulder the longer shot where we're seeing uh pv malcolm and uh, uh skeets watching uh goose uh spinning the shot at 16 okay. he does the kick he pushes down and when the right. when the propeller gets to about uh, eighteen. It I'm thinking to, that's. Oh, I'm no, thinking I'm that's strobing. That's that's the strobing. Yeah, visual. yeah. I think I think you're right. Now it, yeah. it's also combined with the fact that there is, um, it's meeting resistance there too. You know, as the compression is building up in the cylinders, you noticed in you know a few seconds earlier, he's positioning the prop just right to get the leverage just right. But you're also looking for a spot where you're not right up against the downstroke of one of the cylinders. You're looking for a spot where you've got a good you know quarter half a turn of free. A free movement. So I, th- I think you're seeing two things. I think you're seeing the prop starting to swing and then that strobing effect just as it's meeting that that little bit of resistance because there would be uh, there would be a little bit of a stutter there as the ignition catches. Yeah. So it's also a great shot here too, this uh, this longer shot. You know, we're just low enough. We don't see that that's, uh, we don't see who's in the cockpit. You know, we're just, just blocking uh, uh, Billy Campbell's face there. So that's, in the cockpit at this point would either be uh, Craig Hosking or excuse me, or Steve Hinton, one of the one of the two who flew the GB for the film. It is a beautiful shot, though that morning light, and uh, oh, yeah. even you know Malcolm is lit up with a obvious backlight there. But it just it really it, it, you uh, you can feel the whole you know you can feel the weather there in the morning that 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 uh, the, watching the uh, watching the oil smoke blow away. And, right, really um, is a beautiful shot. Yeah, and that's a. Uh, well, we're going to be talking about the uh, the cinematographer in just a little bit, but we'll hang on, we'll hang on to that for a moment. Absolutely. Um, then you notice as he's taxing out, of course, PV has to come and pull the pull the chewed beamens off the rudder. Yes. Which uh, I think it's a little foreshadowing there. I think maybe that might be some bad luck for Cliff. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and I do he, know. I've seen the movie a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what's going to happen. But. And apparently, he doesn't. Uh, they weren't following foreign object debris uh, protocols <laughs> by throwing the, throwing the. Uh, the n- nobody throws things on the ground right. at an airfield. But you know, on a dirt runway, I mean, really, it's it's a losing yeah. battle at that point. Yeah, that's anyway. true. I mean, compared with the gravel that's flying around, it's probably not, right. not going to do much. We come up to uh, some additional. Uh, we come up to more now, now that you know the, the Horner, the James Horner music rises as we're watching them pull out and then uh, we come up with another title costume designer marilyn uh, van striker uh she is probably most famous i mean this this one she did a great job but uh her biggest uh movie that she worked on before this was uh die hard mm. uh just about three years previously and so she's the one that put the dirty uh uh t-shirt on bruce willis very nice and uh so uh it, she obviously has a good eye for for what goes. Uh, Skeets wearing that uh, William Sanderson wearing that Carhartt type uh, uh, jacket, and they all they all look properly dressed. They all seem time appropriate. Period really, appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Hey, now, you and now that. to my to my fellow airplane nerds. So, do you guys find that the 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 field is also period and uh, mechanically appropriate for the time of the film as well? I'm always curious about how they how they back dressed a set like this. Yeah, very much so. And, uh, you know, we, I, really the, the, maybe the single biggest anachronism would be, would be the GB itself, that it would be a little bit dated at this point versus, uh, you know, the latest and greatest uh, racing airplane, but it was still a fast airplane, still a reasonable contender. So, um, and you've got, uh, you've got Cliff and PV, you know, working on a shoestring budget and they, they, it sounds like they built it. Maybe it was crashed and they rebuilt it, something like that. Um, you know, and if that's the, if that's the worst thing that happens is that, uh, you know, this is 1938, and we're flying an airplane from you know, 31 to 32, somewhere in there. Um, but everything else, uh, you know, Jim and I nerd out about the the signage, uh, the logos. Uh, you've got, you know, you'll see Curtis Wright logos, Hamilton Standard uh, uh, the propeller manufacturers. You see their logos popping up uh, if you if you keep a sharp eye on the backgrounds. All the hangers are about right. The big main Bigelow hangar, purpose built for this film, home to a museum these days. Just nice. all of it is really, really has that rich, lush, you know, love letter to the to the late thirties. And it makes the, and there, it makes the film feel real when you have that much depth and that much research behind it. Yeah, and we're seeing we're seeing things like that the city of Los Angeles that that red plane that we were going past and uh, the uh, 
uh, the monocoupe there would be about the same time period. So these are all hot little planes, you know, maybe a little bit outdated, but still right. well within the realm of the uh, the 30s. Yeah, and over PV's shoulder, we see the red and black, the Travel Air Mystery Ship, uh, you know, another another classic racer of the day, famous uh, uh, Poncho Barnes flew that very famously in a number of races. Now, so, are these going to be combat aircraft, or are these going to be built purpose-built for speed and racing? I'm, I'm asking newbie questions here, guys. No, this is great, Tom. This is. Uh, can you be on every episode, please? <laughs> I'm your punter. I, I'm exactly. your moral compass and your punter. Yes. Hey, Tom, throw me another bone, would you? Yes. Um, <laughs> before I hang one on you, kiss us, see? Ah. Um, anyway, so yeah, these... Wearing concrete galoshes. <laughs> concrete galoshes and a yeah, cement <laughs> overcoat, all the whole thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> One of the interesting things about the era, and I, we, we get into this a little bit more in other episodes, but uh, um, this was a point where where civilian private aviation uh, was innovating really ahead of the military, ahead of what the Army uh, at that point would have been the Army Air Corps uh, was really, really up to. And uh, so, you know, in its uh, in its heyday, the GB, like the, the Model Z uh, recreation we see on screen here, the R1, the R2, uh, they were, for a period of time, faster than anything that the military had. So you imagine that today, going out and I'm saying, I'm going to go down to the airport and maybe start tinkering in my garage and then take something out to the airport and end up with something that's you know faster than an SR-71 Blackbird or an F-22 or something like that. It's pretty hard to wrap your head around, but that was the norm at the time. So everything here was built, uh, not everything here, but the airplanes we see that mystery ship, the GB, the, uh, the Brown Racer, Miss Los Angeles. These were all just built to go fast. Nice. And set records. Boys for toys for boys. Exactly. And, and girls, and, sir, of course. And girls, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Poncho Barnes, um, a, a prime example of, a, of an early female race pilot. Amazing. Um, very much considered herself one of the boys. And certainly the work that was done here, you know, sort of informed the industry and in an innovation, you know, came out of that. And then, of course, you know, the U.S. was in uh, involved in World War One or World War Two. Excuse me, World War One, World War Two. About three years after this period, this film is set, and obviously innovation accelerates drastically in, under those circumstances. Right. But uh, but at this point, you know that gold. This is the golden age. This is the you know the mid to late thirties. It was uh, it was the private innovators who were absolutely uh, ahead of the game. I mean, one of these days we really have to talk a little bit more about uh, people like Billy Mitchell, who you know who could see what was coming. Right. The, the importance of that air power would play in less than a decade uh, from from where we're looking at this. And it was it was folks like this that made, you know, the warplanes that would be coming up in just the next five to 10 years possible. Yeah, it, absolutely. Because at, at the time, the Army and the Navy were nowhere near what was what was happening here. Yeah, they were they would have still been relying um, to a large degree on biplane fighters. Now, by 38, 39, you started to see some stuff like the P-40 coming around. So we were starting to accelerate pretty quickly there. Uh, but uh, when the GB was was new, five, six, seven years before this picture takes place, then it was orders of magnitude beyond anything uh, anything that the uh, the military was flying at that point. Uh, this is this is a field of, of the movie, but was any was there any bomber development at the time? Was anybody looking at bombing, uh, uh, you know, other than Mitchell, uh, uh, in terms of building a a purpose built bomber aircraft? Well, you you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned Mitchell. He was the driving force behind it, and uh, and certainly uh, you know at, at this time we had larger you know larger bombers uh, underway and in progress. You know, B seventeen was. Uh, was at least in the works at this point. Prior to this, you had larger uh, biplane bombers uh, and, uh, you know, big sort of elaborate contraptions like the Keystone and the Martin Martin B-10. So they were thinking about it, but uh, people weren't really taking it too seriously until somebody like Mitchell came along to really say, you know, this is the future. This is what's really going to happen. Yeah, and he so, wound up getting court-martialed for it. So. Yes, exactly. Poor for guy. Trouble. Here you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for your sacrifice. Then we named a, we named the B twenty five bomber after him, and I guess that was yeah. okay. Uh, so wow. You know, one other quick quick thing to call out as uh, as you see Cliff taxing out in the GB. Um, so throughout this minute, uh, watch as uh, watch as it's either again Craig Hosking or Steve Hinton taxiing. Watch him making the big S turns. Uh, both down the taxiway and then, you know, up to the runway once it gets there. And the reason for that is like uh, any tailwheel airplane like this, you don't have a great view forward. And the GB in particular is is awful. You sit way at the back. You've got nothing but, 
you know, pudgy fuselage and big round engine in front of you. So you can't see straight ahead at all. Um, most tailwheel airplanes, when we fly them, we do S turns like that. So you go a little bit to the right and then you look out the left side and you can see ahead. Then you turn to the left and look out the right side. That sort of thing. Then you notice once he's lined up on the runway, I, I believe in in uh, the next minute or two after this episode, uh, he'll lock the tail wheel to make make sure he's going to go straight down the runway. And and at that point, you're just assuming until you lift the tail up and can see ahead again. You're assuming there's nothing in front of you. So yeah. all those cows will just stay off the main line. <laughs> exactly. And you hope there's that risk. a stray wad of gum won't hop up into the prop <laughs> at just the wrong instant. There's risk in being a pioneer. That's all it is. That's exactly. Well, as we're watching that those S turns beginning, we come up with the big the big title of of this particular minute: music composed by James Horner, uh, who tragically and ironically was died in an air crash. Horner is such an important part of late twentieth century and early twenty first century uh, composing. He he hit the mark on most uh, big scores. He's He's not quite as famous as, say, uh, John Williams, but uh, he would easily vow, you know, vie for second place there. He's a, of the Jerry Goldsmith variety. Uh, there's so many movies that uh, Horn, Horner was a part of. He, he, he's easily identifiable uh, in, in his themes. He has, he has repeated themes in his, um, in his, in his music. Well, actually, Tom, let me let you talk about ah, Horner. Because, that's, cause that's why you're, you're here. The guy that, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, a, a tragic, tragic loss for, you know, sort of the human race, for film composers, for the film industry. Um, but I guess what you say is he, he, he did pass uh, doing something that he loved, which was apparently experimental aircraft. Um, I, I don't, I didn't really know that that was part of his passion. But when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's a, that's a trip. Right. He had been, I, I deeply regret never getting a chance to meet him, but he had been out to our event here in Oshkosh uh, at least once, if not a couple of times. We just never, uh, never crossed paths. And of course, that's a profound regret of mine. Yeah, you have a, um, you have a few people to take care of during that event. So uh, one or two, or, yeah, or you two. know, half a million. But uh, James is, uh, you know, he was known for for a bunch of different stuff. And uh, some people do sort of uh, take shots at him for being self plagiarizing a lot of the time. But the, the bottom line is, he was able to come up with themes that not only resonated within the context of the picture, but themes that stayed with you, much like a, a, a good song, a good melody. And so when we use the word theme, what we're referring to is a, a selection of notes um, that would identify with a character or with a film or with a uh, sort of overriding uh, feel about the film. And so James was truly one of the masters of the theme, where you would think of someone like uh, Jerry Goldsmith would be much more uh, a master of, uh, I would call it, colors and techniques with the orchestra. His, his palette was much more device-driven um, or, or technical tricks you can play with a group of musicians where James really starts and ends with what you can play of his film score on a piano. So as a film composer myself, you know, we study how do you do this and how do you come up with a theme that resonates and what makes a good theme uh, a good theme or a great theme. And, you know, this, this is truly one of James's great themes for sure. And for us, uh, you know, this is the first sort of pure statement of the theme that you're going to get. Um, but from a perspective of, of composing, you know, he's a guy that would sit down at the piano and he would literally play a theme like this, you know, uh, playing it here. So... I can just always imagine him sitting at a piano and sort of noodling through different ideas until the notes begin to fall. And one of the things that we always try to do as a composer, and I'm certainly not a composer at, at a level of this guy, but a lot of the same techniques are employed. You can take a theme like this and you can play it sad. You know, you can play it wistful. You can sort of paraphrase. So all of these sort of breakdowns and fragmentations of a theme like that give you mileage. You can go. So you can get the adventure version. You can get the scary version. By paraphrasing and pulling apart. 
But what James is always able to do is return you to, if I play with one finger in one octave with no accompaniment. It completely works. And so he's introduced you to this theme in a way that makes us lift up, it rouses us, it makes us feel excited. But then he's basically just teaching you a song here. And so he's going to refer to that song over and over and over throughout this whole picture. And to me, he's one of the best there ever was at being able to do that. So that's that's my little dissertation on on the genius of James. That's uh, that's absolutely incredible. You know, the um, that was stunning. Yes, I, I was saying earlier, and I get goosebumps just hearing you. Even even just that, uh, as you said, one note, one octave, one hand, you no know, accompaniment, sort of thing. Uh, is enough to uh, evoke the memories of this film, and that in in the very first first minute, you know, the screen is black, and then we see the hangar doors opening as the as that theme first begins. Yeah, and it's you know it's not what you expect at the beginning from a uh, you know a rousing sort of swashbuckling adventure film, which is uh, some of what this movie is, but it to, to me. You know what it resonate it resonates with me so deeply as a pilot. It's inextricably associated with flying for me personally. Mm. That that gentle sort of that warm anticipation. We're opening up the hangar. We're going to push the airplane out. It's a big, beautiful, sunny day. It's blue sky. All this stuff. All these good things are going to happen. You know, it's not at that point. It's not pulse pounding adrenaline. It's 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 just this sort of you know warm promise. Or to, to borrow a line from the, the, the band nobody's heard of but me, the three o'clock, it's a warm aspiration at that point. <laughs> it is. And, and I think, you know, uh, because the film, the setting, the period, all is sort of that heyday of Americana, you know, um, that he employs a, 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 a harmonic structure, not to get too musical about it, but... Oh, please it's, do. It, it's, <laughs> yeah, the, do. <laughs> it's the way, you know, uh, if, if you're listening to... To, to Aaron Copeland and you're, you're going back to sort of these true Americana pieces. Now I'm not sure of the time frame about when those sorts of things were composed versus, you know, the period of this, but somehow all of that musical vocabulary is sort of intrinsically combined and it, it puts you in a place and it puts you in a period and it puts you in a state of mind. And whether it's that sort of... <laughs> sort of very pure major chords you're gonna get that uplifting feel and he he really stays in that vocabulary and again that's the beauty of a good theme whether you express it gently whether you express it boldly whether you express it with hesitation or confidence it's still in the most simplest of expressions puts you in a place and a time and a frame of mind that you can't sort of separate from this film once you've watched them work together. It's, it's really, it's, it's amazing to me uh, to watch, to watch a genius hit a ball that far, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it, it has, it has elements of nostalgia and, um, it, and, and like you said, it, it plays to these almost patriotic mm. um, feelings while you're, while you're watching it. At, at Appalachian spring at the time was done. I think it was about five or six years later. Yeah. If I Googled it, it probably, it's, it's <laughs> uh, early forties. Um, hang on a second. 1944, right. excuse me, 1944. So, so yeah, we're we're right in the we're right in the ballpark of of that era of music. And it's the same, you know, uh, when you go to Disneyland and you walk down Main Street and you hear the Tin Pan Alley 20 stuff and you smell the popcorn and you see the taffy, it 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 resonates with us as Americans, I think, you know, not to be nationalistic about it, but it it, it does touch something in us as Americans that is is kind of universal in us in a in a way that transcends words if i can be that sort of esoteric about it you know no i think you're absolutely right i think you hit it and this you know this film is set october 1938 and you know there's obviously you know threats of war looming elsewhere in the world but you know but here at home these are this is a story of of at least certainly in this opening these are passionate people who you know want to get their hands dirty and they want to be they want to work hard and uh, and reap rewards they want to be the best at something and they want to sort of you know rise above both figuratively and literally once they get in, the, in an airplane and go and yeah. fly they want to fly fast they want to move the technology forward they want to win prize money of course <laughs> um but there is something you know very quintessentially uh 
but essentially maybe America at its uh, at its best. I think about uh, about the tone of the movie, and and you certainly see, and you know, Jim, uh, you and I will talk about this. I think a lot uh, over the next. Uh, 100 plus episodes i keep reminding myself um you know joe johnston how, how well this movie bookends with uh, with captain america the first avenger you know this was yes. the love letter to 1938 and that era and you know the first avenger almost picks up uh, time wise where this one leaves off you know we start at that uh, that 39 era new york new york world's fair even though it's not quite called that as such it's the stark expo yeah right um but that brilliant absolutely brilliant period pieces both of them and they keep um, the aesthetics so consistent about what was good and what was right and what was beautiful about what we were all up to as innovators and pioneers and and the, the sort of righteous guys that were out to to make the good guy win and you know right. I, it's something that we all hearken back to and hope for uh, from our sort of leaders and environment today i think you know it's why it's why we all return to pictures like this time and time again because we just want to we want to embrace that feeling of <laughs> we know where we're going and we're going to have a good time getting there, you know? Absolutely. Now, now, Tom, as I understand it, you never had the, the good fortune, uh, a missed opportunity for you, I guess, as it was for me to, to meet uh, James Horner. But uh, but you worked with another composer. And, Jim, if you don't mind us going a little bit further afield here for just a moment, um, could you could you tell us about uh, the composer you worked with that made me cross-eyed with jealousy? <laughs> Well, I think we were, you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, we were we were super lucky to to work with uh, Mr. Williams a couple of different times, and and you know I, I've done a bit of my career kind of being in the in the shadow of the giants. You know, uh, I do a lot of technical support. I do a lot of, I guess you would call it ghost writing or arranging or whatever. When when you're a big wig and you've got intense pressure and incredible deadlines and nonstop rewrites and picture changes, it's very hard to do all of the work yourself. And some composers work in teams and I've been on those teams, but uh, James in particular, and certainly John Williams, they do all the work themselves and what they need underneath them as a support team. So I've been lucky and uh, several occasions to be on, on Williams support team. We were, <laughs> I, I actually have the distinction of, of being able to say that John Williams has recorded, I think eight measures of my music. Um, <laughs> we were working on a trailer wow. for the second Harry Potter film and we had an intro that, uh, that the studio liked, but Williams was going to do his double, double toil and trouble song. So they kept our four chord boys choir intro, which they made John Williams re record in LA with a real boys choir. And then he <laughs> went off into his track. So he actually was forced by the studio to conduct and record, you know, eight measures of our music, which was kind of nutty. <laughs> that's oh, that's um, fantastic wow. though. But uh, we came back around and we were with him on, on Geisha and on Munich. And uh, then again on his themes for the NFL. So we were, we were able to work with him. We actually, funny story, not funny story, sad story, I suppose. Now we were called to work uh, on a film for James uh, and the way James would work is he, he loved a, a studio uh, in Studio City here in Los Angeles called Todd A.O. Now, Todd A.O. has since, uh, it was decided by the studio uh, that they would rather put cubicles in this recording space than to keep it open for uh, for orchestral recording. So that, unfortunately, is no longer with us. But James would go into Todd A.O. and he would book it out uh, for a month. So he would take this, you know, multiple thousand dollar a day studio and just book it for himself and he would go in there and he would write uh, one day and then the orchestra would come another day and they would play and he would revise and he would uh, do a series of recordings and revisions over this month or two month period of time. And it's really a, a kind of a bizarre way to work. Most of the time you have a meeting with the director, the director tells you what you want, you sit down at the piano, you do some you know demos for them and then you go to the recording session and you record the score then you mix the score, then the score is done. But this sort of in the moment composing and working with the orchestra thing is something that James really developed uh, as his own sort of style. So we were actually invited to bring all of our computer gear down, set up in a corner of a room for a month and make weird noises for an otherworldly epic that James was working on at the time. And uh, unfortunately we were not able to, to take that gig, but it turns out that that was the score to Avatar. So Oh, there's wow. a wow. there's a woulda coulda shoulda maybe on yeah. that because it certainly <laughs> turned out to be you know a seminal picture on so many levels but sure. just an interesting bit of tidbit about the way James James works you know and it's interesting for a guy who 
is so you can reduce him down to some piano notes because he's so thematic and yet he was really driven to be an innovator but not necessarily with technology as guys like Zimmer or you know many of the things that we do are driven not by working with a large group of musicians but rather by what we can do in our darkened rooms with our evil toys and so James was <laughs> he was a bit of a purist and even when he would use a keyboard player the keyboard player was sitting in the orchestra and playing along rather than sort of making any sort of pre-recorded material as you would do it today. So James had an interesting workflow and, and it, it led to some really interesting stuff. I, I can't talk about James without, of course, making making fun of his five note danger motif. So any other composers <laughs> out there will will say, OK, he did bring it up. But I, just as a as a thing, if you ever listen to a lot of James, make sure that in every picture you listen to listen for. <laughs> <laughs> which is his his like famous danger motif and he's kind of used it in every film so I'm not I'm not entirely sure where it exists in this picture but you can certainly hear it if you go through his score so always keep an ear out for the five note danger motif <laughs> And you will find it somewhere. So, so that's uh, that's Horner's Wilhelm scream. Uh, Pretty much his Wilhelm scream. Yeah, that's exactly well, right. I know he's got that other one from the Wrath of Khan, which we hear all through this, this one. while he's doing it. That- yeah, and so that's one of those. You know, I, I can't remember that off the top of my head to play it to you, but it, it, it's the da da dum 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 da da dum dum dum. Yeah, and so that, that I guess as a composer, look, there's only twelve notes in the scale, guys, and yeah. <laughs> you know you can only go so far, and so you are going to return to things. And the other thing to always remember is before you say it's a terrible score and I hate that composer, remember he's got three executive producers, two regular producers, a director, a music editor, a music soup who are all telling him what he should be doing. So don't blame the composer necessarily because I've been in situations where they fall in love with a piece of music that you've written for something else and you were trying to tell them, no, you can't have that one. And they're like, but this works better than anything else you've done at any meeting you've been to. And, you know, you're at week six and the thing's got to ship prints in two more weeks and you just kind of run out of time. So before anybody criticizes anybody too much for repetition or taking the easy way, it's an incredibly stressful job that has insane deadlines. So, you know, cut these guys a break. They are geniuses working under extreme duress for sure. (laughs) That's, and and the, mo- the movie's already been edited to the temp track. So. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, oh, this doesn't. And then, I mean, not. I don't know how much in this picture, but like, if you're working on a Pirates, the other thing you deal with is, hey, so we just got these shots back from ILM, and now Davy Jones' tentacle doesn't go up his nose anymore. So this this scene just shrunk by four seconds, which means your perfect ten note melody can only have nine notes. So which note do you want to get rid of? It's just stuff like that. You, re- it's it's crazy. Did you ever think as wow. a kid that uh, that your work day would be affected by whether or not a tentacle went up somebody's nose? I mean, I was could that, only dream. A, I could really yeah, only hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's good to have dreams. Good it, to look, it really look ahead. Is. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so, so something I wanted to ask about a little bit, and uh, you know, for my my claims of uh, having been at least arguably your first partner in professional ah, music, Tom, sure. <laughs> you know, again, 35 plus years ago, um, you know, I, uh, I dabble in music. I play for fun when nobody is around and that's the extent of it really for me. But we, we talked about this theme and how, you know, starting just on the, just on the piano, the hangar doors opening. Now in this minute, we see the airplane taxiing by and we're getting a little bit more purposeful. There's a little bit more I'd almost call it a, a bit of a martial feel to it in the long shot as it's yes. taxiing past. Um, and then is it, uh, am I hearing like there's a f- maybe French horns that come in that are repeating the theme, but is it my imagining there are a couple of notes different to give it a slightly different tone? Yeah, so I'm, I'm listening here through. So now we've got prop start. Right. Now we roll. So we hold, hold, and then we return sort of to the second half of the, the phrase. Right. And then we're going to have a modulation once we get to the wide shot. And so it stays in the same key. So what you got? Right? And so, yes, right. that is. Yeah. And so it's just, it's taking, as I said before, a two or three notes. And uh, you know that if you go. going to get triumphant uplifting heroism so you take that sort of and you uh sorry so 
because you don't want to go, you don't want to give them that chord, so you, you sort of work around with those notes in a rhythm or a subdivision that gives you the energy or the vibe that you want, but you don't ever so, pay it off. You want to sort of tease them with it, you know? That's what I was just thinking. So that, uh, that chord that you, you didn't give us there just a moment ago, what, whatever chord that is. That one, that's the sort of I'm hesitating, but then... Ah, there's the payoff chord. So the right, that's you the resolution. That, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and yeah, so that's French horns. And so that's kind of what the composer's job is then to do once you have the theme that you know works. And this is kind of what I was referring to with Jerry Goldsmith. He was such a master at giving you emotion simply by changing who is playing and what they're playing. So as, as Hal correctly pointed out, that's going to be French horns in there, you know. Um, and so the way that that holds through, you know, the horns are always a very triumphant thing, and then he'll probably... And then you add a trumpet or a high violin, sort of repeat the same thing, and then eventually when the shot changes, you're holding... Now we give the resolution to the other chord, and you can use this technique to build drama, to wait. Sometimes it's simply that this shot is three seconds longer than my melody, so I have to sort of vamp for two counts until the, the shot changes, and now I can go to the next bit. So it's just a combination of all of those techniques to try to get mileage out of your theme and score the picture. Did that answer the question in a very roundabout way? Absolutely. No, that's uh, <laughs> this is fast. I feel like I'm getting a, a master class in music theory, something I wish well, I would have done, you know. <laughs> Well, oh, three, this, four decades ago, whatever. Th this has airplanes, so it's way more interesting than an actual theory class. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at the uh, sheet music uh, currently, and there's like a lot of you know one bar and two four time, and then going back to four four. So like you were saying, it's just vamping to get, and this needs a little another second and a half, so we'll just bump it a little bit. And yeah, and uh, there's a funny funny thing about that, um, it, it, and I'm sure in uh, in aviation it's the same. We have modern terms that actually have sort of a, an analog counterpoint in history. And so one of the terms we use in the film business is music editor. And it used to be, uh, well, today the music editor takes everybody's digital files, throws it into a computer, works with the filmmaker to sort of put the music files where they belong, and then you can slip them around or chop them to fit. Um, well, back in the day, quote unquote, no computers, this was all recorded to tape. And so when you would get a new version of the film in, uh, a new work print, uh, and they, they always call it, quote, locked picture, which means it's finished, we're not going to change it, and that's complete BS. They never, ever mean that. <laughs> and so a lot of the time, the composer, uh, certainly a Horner or a Williams or a Goldsmith, where it was, hey, we went to the orchestra, we recorded the orchestra, it's done, we're not going back in the studio, and now you've changed picture, what do we do? And so some of those two four bars can literally be um, we've taken this and we've chopped two beats out of the score. We've cut, you know, 1.6 seconds out of the tape. And that's where the quote edit comes from. And, oh. and another interesting one that came out of that world is cut and paste. And so if you're looking at a score and they make a picture change, uh, let's say you've got something you really like at bars three through seven, you want that same thing at bars 21 through 28 they would literally take a, a, a mimeograph of the score, cut out the bars that they wanted, and tape it to the bars that they wanted to change. It was literally cut and paste the music. And so <laughs> these techniques have sort of pushed into the digital domain. But nonetheless, I lost three frames. I got to take that from a 4-4 four, four bar to a 3-4 bar to lose that beat to make the picture fit. And so when you're looking at a score it's really kind of frightening from like a piano sheet music because it looks so complicated, but really he didn't do that because the music made him, he did it because the picture demanded it. So you kind of have two choices. You can either rewrite the music to fit the new picture or just look for some places to cheat. And that's where your two, four bar come, comes from. Wow. Well, it works. It totally <laughs> works. <laughs> yeah, it really does. So uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're continuing on as the, as the, uh, uh, 
as we get to the next credit, well, we had there's an interim credit with co-producer Dave Stevens, who also happens to be the guy that invented the Rocketeer. Yeah. We'll be we'll be talking more about him tomorrow. But uh, we get up to the uh, the editor credit, which uh, editors are always really good at getting a really nice meaty spot on the uh, <laughs> on the title page because they're the ones putting themselves in in the picture. Yes. Uh, Arthur Schmidt comes up as our as our editor there. Uh, Arthur Schmidt had quite a uh, a lineup of of movies. He did uh, probably best known for Back to the Future. Uh, he also did Pirates of the Caribbean. I also think he did two and three as well. Uh, he did uh, Tom Cruise movies like Castaway and uh, Forrest Gump. He goes way back to um, That'd be Tom, Coal Tom Hanks, but not Tom Cruise. Tom, Tom Hanks. I'm, yeah, excuse, yeah. I'm Tom Cruise. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm full. Of, I'm full of cough medicine it's right all now. Good. So it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, I could never tell yeah, the dif- I, difference among Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, and Tom Geyer. I yeah, always struggled. I'm it's, the it's most like, handsome of the three, and that's never, what it is. Them, <laughs> you never see them together. No, I've thing. never hmm. seen them in the same room at the same time. Oh, hmm. uh, could hmm. be. I was hiding behind Oprah's couch. That was me. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> ah, blame Zeno. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so he, he goes all the way back to Coal Miner's Daughter and uh, really knows how to cut a film together, obviously. The GB drives – as the GB makes an S turn around that, uh, that title, we get to uh, production designer Jim Bissell, who uh, – he mostly cut his teeth in the industry uh, working for Steven Spielberg on Amazing Stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, he started out with uh, Spielberg back with uh, E.T., uh, best known for his production design on 300, which was uh, quite, a, quite a tour de force. And, you know, obviously he knew what he was doing. Um, and in this, this, the production design is fantastic. I mean, everything, you know, when you think about the design of the, uh, the South Seas Club, um, expanding the, um, uh, the, the legend of Hell House House that's, uh, you know, in Hollywood with, uh, Timothy Dalton's, uh, estate, uh, and even things like the, uh, the design of the interior of the Bulldog Cafe. That's quite, quite a deal. I mean, Jim Bissell is the guy that's responsible for, for all that. And we'll be seeing... We'll be seeing his hand in a lot of these things coming up for the rest of the film. And then finishing as, uh, as the GB uh, gets to make the big U-turn to, uh, to, to take off, uh, we see the, uh, uh, the big director of uh, photography, Hiro Narita, who he, did, uh, he was involved in uh, another Horner uh, movie, Star Trek VI, the, uh, um, the, un- the, what is it, the un- Undiscovered Country. Undiscovered, Undiscovered, yeah. yes. Undiscovered Country, there we go. <laughs> It was unsomething, yes. Undiscovered Country. And uh, probably best known for uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He was responsible for making, uh, you know, German Shepherd-sized ants and uh, things like that. So, so he, another uh, Joe Johnston film. So Exactly. Right? So there's, yeah. there's so a they're, tie there. They're, now, if I re- uh, remember, oh, excuse me, if I remember right, and by remember right, I mean, you know, looking it up uh, a day or two ago, uh, he also, and Narita also worked on uh, Always. Uh, Steven Spielberg yes. talking about the the fire bombers and things. So another uh, sort of a, a nouveau uh, aviation classic. All great Absolutely pictures. romantic pictures of planes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, aviation movie. That one. S- stunning color work in that with all the the flames and the oranges and reds right. and things. As we uh, as we work through this, just to note um, back to Hal's Hal's sort of mention of orchestration techniques. You know, you can even hear. Uh, over these same shots we're talking about. So we have the wide shot. We hear the French horns take it. Then he has to up the ante. So we go around. We do a modulation. Now we add the trumpet on that same sub-theme. And then we have the third shot here as he's going around uh, the title cards. Um, So the Amy Schmidt card is our trumpet. The Bissell card is the trumpets. And then now we have the wide shot with Hero's card. And you hear now we've returned to much more of a grand statement where they've subdivided the time to give us a, a real spacious shot. So it's a really good way to sort of listen to taking the theme, paraphrasing it, modulating, paraphrasing again, and then returning to a more pure statement of it with a very regal orchestration. It's a, just a great one, two, three example of how to, how to take a theme and do stuff with it. Yeah, I, I wish we were having you on tomorrow because of the takeoff he's going to be getting into the uh, uh, the xylophones, bringing more percussion in. Yeah, the, to, uh, yeah. to get that that anticipatory sound. Exactly. Well, you guys know. You just pretend I'm here. Tom would say this. Yeah. That's all you got to do. <laughs> exactly. We'll channel Tom. Exactly. Uh, it's and, uh, the, such a great. Ver- oh, at, go ahead, Jim. Oh, sorry, at that very last second, we're seeing Larry Franco. We'll, ch- we'll talk a little bit more about him tomorrow, right. but. Uh, he's, he's one of the, the executive producers on this thing. So he's, he's a money man. Yep. 
And uh, he, his big credits were uh, The Thing, the, uh, the John Carpenter movie, and the other John Carpenter movie, Escape from New York. So the, he definitely knows action and adventure. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about him and, and the other guys exec producing this movie tomorrow. You know, just as we're, uh, as we're winding up, uh, we, we talked about Hiro Narita and his card. I'm just looking at that shot again, the way that's laid out. Um, and it's just, that shot is just pitch perfect. And in, in, uh, we're looking straight down the runway. We're right dead center on the runway. We're looking straight ahead. There's almost a, you know, almost a vanishing point at the, at the trees at the far end of the runway. The horizon line is, you know, if we want to talk about rule of thirds, that horizon line, if you measure that on your screen, it's just about, mm. just about perfectly the top third of the screen. Yeah, the so composition the G- is brilliant. It's it's just flawless. And you've got the, the GB making a very, very natural, uh, you know, from the pilot's point of view, sort of swinging wide to the right, and then going to bring the tail around to line up with the center of the runway. And it's, you, know, you can look at this and feel like, uh, that the pilot must have been actually taxiing around a giant title card sitting there with Hiro Narita's name on it, the way it was so perfectly put together that the that the shot stays centered and the airplane moves off to the side. That action, you know, takes you from the vanishing point down into the left corner of it. Uh, everything about it just flows so smoothly. And I imagine it, it, if I were... It, it almost looks... Go ahead. It, it it almost looks like this is the this is if you were going to make a demo reel for uh, what do you do as a cinematographer? I'll do this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Here's uh, here's my resume right here, and and uh, you think about Schmidt sitting there editing this and putting uh, putting the the title cards where they needed to go. He must have just been clapping his hands at this one because oh you left me a perfect spot. You know exactly. how wonderful how wonderful that is. And in my world, more print either print publishing or web publishing and things like this. And and I only dabble in some pieces of of this aspect of it. But it seems like we're always looking for photos that uh, uh, that have room for a call out or a sidebar or something like that. Anything that's shot sort of wide enough to give us a little bit of empty space to play in. And it's uh, if you're not shooting with that in mind, it's amazing how impossible that can be to find to get something laid out just right in a magazine. I mean, luckily we I, we've got you know a couple of graphic designers that work for us and do our magazines and do our web layouts. Um, you know, if that were left to me, you would just have Comic Sans types right across the, the front of the airplane, <laughs> and the whole thing would be uh, mimeographed, as you said, Tom, and that would be it. So, but uh, but it's just a fascinating little little bit of perfection right there. And well, that, that and it, there is a musical equivalent too. You know, when when you're looking for space to say something, it's another one of those. Hey, they. The, the foley fell away, and the airplane noise is at a minimal. And I'm writing in a register that can be heard. As a as a as a composer, we live for those moments where the director has the foresight to make room for the music to say something. So it's a, there there is a correlation there as well. Yeah, and one thing to remember about this movie, as Dave Stevens was a producer, he also helped. Uh, do the storyboards. So I think he probably even saw the title sequence and had it all laid out on little index cards on a big, <laughs> on a big bulletin board somewhere. So this might this might have been a design, even though it was you know photographed by her and Rita. The design may have been a Dave Stevens design. It's uh, it really is a, an epic look that 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 beautiful shot of the entire uh, Chaplin Field at once. Oh, absolutely. And and of course for me the airplane nerd, I'm I'm looking at the airplanes in the background trying to see what I can spot the. You know, back on the right, we see that blue Cadron uh, uh, racer, another one of those replica racers from the the Golden Age, built out in uh, built out in California, uh, used in the film. That one came to Oshkosh here, uh, uh, oh five maybe five years ago or so. We had a, a nice display for it and contacted the local uh, local Citroen car club and had a couple of classic French cars with it. So it was a French racer of some some repute. It, it- is it flyable? Is it, it is, uh, yes. Is it disp- so no, it, and it uh, and it flew out here. It didn't get trucked here from California. It flew a couple thousand miles to be on display and and uh, wow. do flybys in the show. And then uh, and then just behind that uh, looks like that's that Curtis. I think it's the Curtis Robin. It might be might be something else. It's a little bit obscure there. But of course, over on the left we see the monocoupe and the props from uh, Miss Los Angeles and the the uh, uh, mystery ship. But this everything that we see is so lush those grandstands off to the right very typical of air shows back in the in that era which we'll see a lot more of in later episodes all the signage all the advertising could i love this movie anymore probably not probably not yeah and then that's you know that that is the production designer it, it, the person responsible for making the worlds seem real so it's it's yeah. that was the funnest part for me getting into movies being such a movie geek is to see 
what the role of all of these people in the actual execution of a motion picture really is and what understanding what these titles I've read, you know, ACE, what does that mean? Well, it means you do this and it means you answer to these guys. It's, it's very cool to see just how important to the overall look and feel of a movie that each one of these individuals really is. Yeah, just just realizing, that, I mean, you know, when you walk into a theater, the, the average audience thinks that the actors are making it up as they go along and somebody's chasing them with a camera. Right. And, and then somebody else uh, somewhere has a Casio keyboard and they're doing yeah, their best. Yeah, knock out a score. I mean, the, right. the best example of that I have, just, just quickly here, a little, little story. I was working on uh, Pirates 2 with Team Zimmer and we were invited to go to a, a cast and crew screening and uh, we're sitting in the uh, the El Capitan in Hollywood with nothing but basically crew. So everybody in there was either an extra or a set, whatever. They had something to do with the film that wasn't being an actor. And we're watching the whole thing. And, and there's the one scene where Jack steals the chest and he runs through the thing and he drops down. And we finally open up the chest to see the heart. And in the heart, in the chest is this little teeny beating heart. And from up in the second balcony, you hear two guys' voices go, <laughs> and you realize that their whole position on this entire film was probably that one shot of the beating heart of Davy Jones. So, you know, each of us play one tiny little little part in getting one of these things done. It's pretty crazy. Wow. But it all works, as I say. It all comes together. Um, it does. Well, it, I don't know about yeah. Pirates 2, but yeah, you know. Well, oh. but the, <clears throat> yeah, but the that's com- a different yeah, movie for a different... Yeah, exactly. A, a different series. Yeah. The complexity of it, I don't think, can be understated. There's no, so really many, uh, so many moving parts. As a layperson in this, I know just enough to know that uh, it's completely overwhelming to my mind. Yeah, for sure. This is not bad for uh, we're only 180 seconds into the movie. There's <laughs> been a lot to talk that's, about that's... in this past hour. We do appreciate Tom. Thanks so much for being on the show and explaining all this stuff of of a movie that Hal and I both know and love. It's amazing. Just you can keep digging and digging into this thing, and there's more aspects and assets that, that you can talk about. I mean, we could, we could go on for several hours, but uh, I think we're running the batteries down on people's uh, androids and things exactly. while, they're, while they're on their treadmills. Uh, we'll be continuing the conversation tomorrow if, if you'll join us here on the show. Uh, we, if you'd like to uh, talk back to us, we've got a bunch of different social media you can get us on. We're on Twitter, of course, at Rocketeer Minute. And uh, on Facebook, uh, the Rocketeer Minutes Bulldog uh, Cafe. And you can find us at the big site, rocketeerminute.com, where you can catch up on our two past episodes. Follow what's going on there. There's conversations going on in every episode, so check in there, too. If you are not already subscribed, go onto iTunes or onto Google Play. Look for Rocketeer Minute and press the subscribe button, and you can get this delivered hot and fresh every early morning right to your uh, device that you're listening to on your treadmill or on your jog around, <laughs> around your neighborhood. Join us here tomorrow as we finally get to watch the GB take off uh, here on the Rocketeer Minute. And until next time, over and out. Go get him, kid.